It's the 1990s. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is a well-established for their production of large cotton gauze dressings that are sterile and sealed against germs, a first of its kind. An employee by the name of Earl Dickinson is recently married to a young, rather accident-prone woman. Her domestic cuts and burns are too minor for the company's large surgical dressing, so Earl, in a moment of vision, cuts a small square of sterile gauze, also known as the white part of the band-aid, and secures it to her finger with an adhesive strip. Earl's forced to make so many of these bandages for his clumsy wife, he devises a small method for a small production of them. And in order to keep the adhesive part from sticking together, he lines them with the crinoline fabric, the brown part of the band-aid. And soon, Johnson & Johnson begins production of Earl's invention. In a brilliant marketing move, they distribute for free an unlimited number of band-aids to all the Boy Scout troops across America. It doesn't take long for them to become a household item. It is estimated that Johnson & Johnson has since made more than a hundred million band-aids. I know, it is insane. These small bandages have become a staple in every household as it is the go-to item for small cuts, burns, gashes, etc. However, there is two main problems with these band-aids. They have low antibacterial properties and they don't heal wounds as, as efficiently as they could. These two problems are exactly why we develop band-aids. Here's a sneak peek. <laughs> goes without saying, I'm sure you are well of aware of what the band-aid solves and I'm sure you've used it at least once in your life to heal the cuts, scrapes, gashes that you get, you know, maybe your first bike ride and you decided to use it. But the problem isn't that the band-aid doesn't work, it's, it's that the band-aid could be better, yet it's still not. Let's dive deep into the specific problem though, you know, conventional healing takes far too long and band-aids whose main job is to keep the injury moisturized, are basically used to help solve this problem, but it still doesn't always work. A simple hand laceration or cut has infection rates from 5 to 32%, which originates from differences in types of antibiotics used, the severity of the wound environment, and any other things your hand is placed on. Furthermore, an infection that, or an infected incision may begin to harden as the tissue underneath is inflamed and this incision itself may appear to be swollen or puffy as well. And as that incision gets red and infected or has red streaks radiating from it, that is a clear indication that the surrounding skin has become infected. So preventing an infection is a priority when it comes to wound he healing as it brings even more problems with it if the wound does become infected. And obviously no one wants that, like come on now, really? But there have been studies that have been conducted to help solve and battle these issues. And beneficial results have been shown, however, there are some flaws in many of the studies I looked into, read, researched, analyzed, whatever. Which is why I ultimately took a piece from everything when I designed the final Band X solution. And let me tell you all about it. So, in order to choose how to exactly fabricate the next gen band aid, 
I first had to understand what has been tested in work, and hence the um, extreme, extreme amount of reading research. Then I had to perform an analysis to see what materials and techniques worked in each study, and what materials altered the properties of the end result. Once all of those materials and techniques were compiled, I had to make sure they were cross-compatible, in the sense that different materials from different studies would actually bond with each, each other and become a scaffold. And lastly, I had to simply prepare a step-by-step -step instruction as to how this scaffold for the band-aid could be created, or at least a close enough model. And so after all that's been done, here is the end product for the next gen band -aid, a nanofibrous electrospun scaffold band. And what this means is that essentially, the design of Bandex relies on using nanotechnological properties and taking those properties, creating a solution, which I'll dive into just in a second. Take that solution, electrospin it to make extremely thin fibers. Those fibers then become cross-linked into a thin sort of mat. And that mat is then layered on top of the cotton you or the white piece you find on your band-aid. And that mat contains all the nanotechnological properties, antibacterial properties, speed healing properties that you need to improve wound healing. So getting into it, the materials I used were pretty extensive. Uh, gelatin, a widely used in wound healing due to its excellent biodegradability, biocompatibility, cell adhesion, proliferation, and resistance to immuno, uh, immunogenicity and pathogen transmission. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body, and gelatin is a degraded form of it, so it makes perfect sense to use it. Next, I'm sure none of you have probably heard of this, but methacrylic and hydride, and it helps form covalent attachments to cheetah sand, which is another material I used, to create better adhesion properties. The cheetah sand is actually used to build and maintain structurally strong and connected fibers in the scaffold, so making sure it doesn't really break. I used a phosphate buffered saline to prevent cells from rupturing or shriveling due to osmosis pure when I have to purify the solution. I use silver nitrate, which gives the silver particles necessary for the antibacterial property, ascorbic acid or basically vitamin C, and that's used for growth, development, and repair of all body tissues, including formation of collagen and wound healing. So you can kind of see the cycle that it's all starting to connect together. And some ethanol, so a simple alcohol to purify and clean the scaffold mats, you know. We don't want them to be infected before we even use them, so. Yeah. Those are basically most of the materials, but if something comes up, uh, I'll explain it. Next, taking all those materials and making a sort of solution prep. There is two main solutions that need to be created for this process. The scaffold solution itself and the photo initiator solution to cross-link the scaffold. The scaffold solution becomes the nanofibrous mat, and the other solution is used to sink the mats into it to create bonds that link the polymers together, allowing for elasticity and strong structures, and that is called cross-linking. So the scaffold solution takes your gelatin, dissolve it in the phosphate buffered saline, then your methacrylic anhydride is added to that. After the reaction occurs, more phosphate buffered saline is added to stop the reaction. Kind of counterintuitive, but it works. That mixture is put through dialysis to basically purify it and remove any excess particles. And now we're going to name that the gel A solution. Now you're going to take your silver nitrate, dissolve it in deionized water to make it as pure as possible to make an AG2 solution. This, the AG2 and gel A solutions mix together at a mass ratio of 3 to 100. So that means for every, let's say, 3 milliliters of AG2 solution, there is a 100 milliliters of the gel A solution to get the perfect combination. Now this solution is now named the gel AG2 solution. It's going to get confusing, but I promise I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Now you kind of set that aside just for a bit. You're going to take the ascorbic acid, dissolve it in deionized water again. That's going to be your ASK A solution. Then the cheetah sand is added to the ASK A solution, mix it around. Now you have your CS ASK A solution. Stay with me, one last step. 
Now you take the gel AG2 solution, mix it with the CS Ask A solution at a volume ratio of 1 to 1. That means for every 1 milliliter of the gel AG2 solution, you mix it with 1 milliliter of the CS Ask A solution. Now, when you mix those two together, you should get a final solution that you set aside named the gel CS AG2 solution, the solution that becomes the mats. Now, like I said before, there's two solutions. So the photo initiator solution is a, a bit more of a simpler process. You take this really, really, really long and complicated chemical called 2-hydroxy-4-2-hydroxy-ethoxy-U2-methylpropanate. You don't need to know at all what it is. All you need to know is basically it is a photo initiator that will basically react when um, exposed to UV light and radiation to basically crosslink the solution. So that is added to ethanol, completely dissolve it, and that's the photo int solution. Now you take hexafluoro 2 propanol or HVIP, which is basically just a solvent used to mix things around, and you prepare that solution, you prepare like that liquid, basically set it aside, and that's going to be used to dissolve the porous foam in. More on that in a bit. So you kind of have a bit of three-ish solutions, too, that kind of go in the photo initiator solution. So now it's the interesting part, piecing it all together. So we have the solutions and understanding of what all the materials do. So now all that's left is to kind of take the solutions and make the scaffold mat. So without further ado, here's the steps. You first freeze dry your gel CS AG2 solution for about a week, and there should be a resultant white porous foam or an equivalent of such. You dissolve that in the HVIP solution, which I previously mentioned. You take that dissolved solution, load it into a syringe, electrospin it until a desired scaffold size has been formed. The scaffold will be roughly shaped in about a thin rectangle, hence the name mat. Now you take those electrospun scaffold mats, immerse it in the photo ink solution to prepare it for cross-linking. Keep the mats immersed and expose it to UV light for 10 minutes. This has been proved and tested that 10 minutes is the optimal time for these types of things to create the most cross-linkable mat without reaching the threshold breaking point. So you cross-link all the fibers. Now to confirm the cross-linking, you want to submerge those mats in deionized water. So the uncross-linked fibers will actually dissolve away. You take those mats, pull them from the water, dry it, and that thin material, that thin nanofibrous mat, is attached to the white cotton found on the band-aid using an acrylate glue, which bonds strongly with the methacrylic and hydride, making sure that the mat safely and is securely attached to the white cotton on the band-aid, and it is officially ready for use. So that's basically the whole process, and there is a very high chance this will heal wounds exponentially faster with little to no risk. Now, obviously the biggest question is, did it work? <laughs> Sorry to say, but I have no idea. You see, Bandex is a very theoretical and has not been yet tested in a lab, but it is a future goal. However, research does point in the right direction and the idea could work. There are three main reasons why I and you should have reason to believe this will work. The final design has components pulled from research studies that had proved their design successfully and it worked on healing wounds faster and preventing bacterial infections with little to no harm to the body. Reason number two, all the materials used in the design are biocompatible with each other and being biocompatible with the body as well as biodegradable. So there is a slim, slim, slim chance that the design will produce a negative effect on the body. Reason number three, the fundamental principle of the idea won't change. If the design I have right now doesn't work, all it takes is a simple material change or simply changing the amount of a material to create a more optimal solution that will work. So even if it doesn't work, it can and will work. Kind of confusing, but it works. So keeping this in mind, I have come to the conclusion that Band X may very, very well see the light of day and one day may actually be made in a lab. All the research points in the right direction, and I do hope to get this created and tested at one point to see the results. So through the use of various nanoparticles, biomaterials, and other polymers, Bandex has the potential to heal wounds 
three times faster, prevent bacterial infections, and lastly, speed up wound healing in patients who have conditions that lead with low blood flow like diabetes. And low blood flow is a major cause of slower wound healing because the blood can't come and repair the wound. So you might be thinking, how can something so, so, so small leave such an impact on society? You see, the beauty of this design I created is the scalability of it. I have designed it so that the fibrous mat size can be electrospun to any desired size. This essentially entails that the technology can be applied to any bandage, regardless of size. The whole goal is to eventually scale this up for surgical bandages and the such, but you have to start somewhere. And I decided to start small with band-aids. I aim to have this commercially available for all who need it, and hopefully this becomes the next norm in band-aids at one point. Though there is a lot of room for improvement and more R&D, the fundamentals will remain the same. And one day, you will get your hands on a band-aid with the capacity to heal your wounds around three times faster than right now. So is this the future? You tell me. I believe this can change the world and revolutionize wound healing like never before. Thank you, and see you in the next one.